This video is brought to you by True Tales of Buried Treasure, the largest collection of old treasure magazines in the West. On our website, you can search for individual treasure stories by region, or buy our original magazines themselves. To pay us a visit, please click on the link in the description. Enjoy. Samuel Walcott and James McNally had barely descended into Marsh Pass from Black Mountain when they found themselves under attack by Navajos, led by Hoskini Begay. Caught off guard, they swiftly retaliated, firing upon the whooping assailants attempting to close in on them. Opting for a secluded path rather than the main route, which was notorious for ambushes by renegade Navajos or Paiutes, the two prospectors had chosen to traverse the remote Sigi country. Laden with raw gold from their mine near Blue Canyon, they fought fiercely to fend off the attackers. Their accurate shooting forced a temporary retreat, allowing them a brief respite to flee towards Sigi Canyon. Realizing the imminent threat, they hastily descended into the canyon's massive salmon pink walls, aiming to fortify their position. Despite their urgency, they paused to bury their precious cargo before continuing further into the canyon. Tragically, one of their mules succumbed to its wounds, while the other was severely injured. Facing a dire situation, Walcott suggested burying the gold and returning to retrieve it later. They complied, with McNally assisting in concealing the treasure deep within the canyon. Upon emerging cautiously from Segi, they found no sign of hostile presence, prompting them to journey back towards Black Mountain, traversing the rugged terrain and collecting additional ponies along the way. Despite warnings from seasoned locals about the dangers posed by the warring tribes in the region, the partners were determined to retrieve their fortune as soon as possible. Their departure was swift, and as they made camp on March 30, 1883, halfway between their mine and the western slopes of Black Mountain, they remained resolute in their mission to reclaim their buried wealth, undeterred by the looming threats. That night, five Navajos known to Samuel Walcott and James McNally as acquaintances from the region joined them at their campsite. However, McNally, who was around 23 years old, harbored suspicions toward all Indians following the surprise attack near Marsh Pass. Aware of the potential danger lurking in the darkness beyond the campfire's glow, he cautiously distanced himself from the Navajos engaged in conversation with Walcott. Suddenly, a noise caught McNally's attention, and he turned to witness one of the Navajos, having stealthily approached behind the unsuspecting Walcott, fatally striking him with a wood axe. Despite McNally's attempt to shout a warning and fire his gun, he was too late to save his partner's life. Fending off the assailants, McNally managed to drive the Navajos away from the camp, but not before they killed the spare horses and wounded him in the left shoulder. With determination, McNally mounted his injured horse and fled into the dense juniper and pinyon forest, opting for the nearest old trail. Pausing briefly near Lolomi Point at dawn for respite, he pressed on towards Blanding, Utah, where he hoped to seek aid from friends. Realizing the necessity of a well-armed party to retrieve the buried gold, and aware of his horse's injuries, McNally continued northward. However, the sound of pursuing Navajos prompted him to hasten his pace, leading to the exhaustion of his wounded mount. Near El Capitan, McNally was overtaken and killed in a fierce skirmish with his attackers. Reports of the murders reached S.E. Marshall, the acting Indian agent at Fort Defiance, initiating an investigation. Although the murders occurred outside the Navajo reservation boundaries at the time, subsequent efforts were made by Agent John Bowman to apprehend the perpetrators, including dispatching Navajo tribal police and requesting military assistance. Prior to their arrival, agency police arrested several Navajos suspected of involvement in the killings, including Dugi Belenth Laki and Danette Sosi. Hostin Hoskini, aware that his son, Hoskini Begay, had led the renegade group, attempted to divert attention by surrendering himself at Fort Defiance, ostensibly to protect his son. However, Huskini's actions were tinged with mockery as he exploited the ensuing delays and confusion to aid his son's escape from prosecution for the murders of white prospectors. Huskini Begay spent nearly a year confined in the Fort Wingate guardhouse as legal proceedings unfolded, while other Navajos were eventually released due to lack of federal prosecution. Meanwhile, Buckskin Billy, entrusted with the knowledge shared by Walcott and McNally regarding their buried gold in Seagy Canyon, discreetly confided in his close associate Jonathan Paul Williams, 
a seasoned frontiersman at Blue Canyon. Williams, who had migrated from California in pursuit of the lost Merrick Mitchell mine, recognized the peril posed by Huskini's band of renegades and advised caution. Despite assurances from Huskini upon his release, Williams remained wary of the treacherous group. In accordance with an agreement with Huskini, Williams, accompanied by his sons and buckskin Billy, ventured into Sigi Canyon in 1885 to search for the gold. However, their efforts proved fruitless, and they found no trace of the buried treasure. Disappointed but undeterred, Williams resolved to explore the mine where Walcott and McNally had worked, believed to be located near Blue Canyon. The historical significance of the area, dating back to Aboriginal migrations and military expeditions, underscored the importance of their quest. Despite the lack of success in uncovering the hidden gold, Williams remained determined to pursue the origins of the treasure, guided by his extensive experience as a prospector. Upon arrival at the mine, they discovered it had been claimed by two middle-aged prospectors who had hurried to the site upon hearing of Walcott and McNally's murders. Although these prospectors reported finding no gold in the initial tunnel dug by the original miners, they expressed frustration over continual harassment by local Indians who demanded their departure. Returning to his trading post, Williams restocked their supplies before returning to Sigi Canyon with his party. Aware of the various points of entry Walcott and McNally could have used to access the canyon from Marsh Pass, they embarked on a systematic search for any overlooked clues indicating the deceased prospector's route. During a discussion around the campfire, Buckskin Billy speculated about the possibility that the gold might have originated from a different prospecting site, such as Bluebird Canyon, prompting consideration from Williams. Ultimately, they decided to focus their efforts on locating the hidden cache first, hopeful of instant wealth. The following morning, young Bill Williams stumbled upon the carcasses of the two mules near the mouth of Sigi Canyon, scattered by scavenging wildlife. Energized by the discovery, they relocated their camp alongside the creek and commenced a thorough search for any signs of disturbance in the soil or potential hiding spots. Despite their meticulous efforts, including probing the ground and examining loose stones for any signs of concealment, they found no trace of the elusive cache. Even after extending their search further up the canyon, their endeavors yielded no results. Their frustration mounted, exacerbated by the arrival of Ute Chief Polk and his warriors, who brazenly helped themselves to their food without a word of explanation. Recognizing the volatile nature of the situation, Buckskin Billy discreetly withdrew into the shadows, while Williams attempted to defuse the tension by explaining that they had permission from Hoskini to prospect in the area. However, Polk asserted his authority, claiming dominance over the territory, leading to a resigned acceptance of the Indians' appropriation of their provisions. After finishing his meal and casually wiping his mouth with the back of his hand, Polk stood up and issued a directive. The white men would be spared as long as they didn't resist the UTEs confiscating their livestock and belongings. Addressing Williams, he indicated that they could make their way back to their trading post by crossing the mountain. At that moment, Buckskin Billy entered the camp with two UTEs under the threat of his rifle. Confirming his earlier suspicions, he found that the UTEs had taken control of the livestock left to graze in a nearby cove. Instructing them to sit down, he directed those by the fire to prepare food for the white men. Despite his initial bravado, Polk acquiesced to Billy's firm stance, assisted by William's sons. When the UTEs were finally instructed to depart, they left without further protest, heading down the canyon to their ponies. Given William's apprehension about a potential ambush, he insisted on leaving the area immediately, a decision the group promptly acted upon. Two weeks later, Huskini arrived and excavated the area beneath the jerky. However, they found nothing else buried there, leading Williams to speculate that the utensils may have been cached to lighten the load on the horses. Although Huskini assured them that no gold had been found on the murdered prospectors, the party embarked on an extensive search of the entire area, camping there for 10 days and meticulously combing through the canyon. Despite Hoskini's occasional doubts and attempts to find similar sites, their efforts yielded no results. In the ensuing month, Williams, his sons, and Buckskin Billy tirelessly searched for any signs of the Walcott McNally secret mine to no avail. Even the mine claimed by the other prospectors failed to produce any gold. Over the years, numerous treasure hunters scoured Sigi Canyon for the elusive cache without success. A 
Around 1910, Hoskini enlisted the help of John Wetherill, the Indian trader at Kienta, to search for the treasure in the canyon. Despite continued efforts, the search persisted well into the early 1930s. A note to prospective treasure hunters, any attempts to prospect for this cache would require obtaining a permit from the Navajo tribe, located in Window Rock, Arizona. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to read the original article or purchase the magazine from which it was taken, please check out our website, truetalesofburiedtreasure.com.